Good evening. You're very welcome to the Women's League of Ireland podcast here on FinalWhistle.ie with myself, Brefney Early, and of course, once again, Aaron Clark of the Women the WNL Show. Is that the right title for you, Aaron? I'd say that's the right one. I probably I don't know if we'll rebrand at this stage, but it's I know we're kind of too. <laughs> Uh, it is what it is. We're here uh, another week, episode nine of the podcast. We're going to be chatting to Galway United's Jenna Slattery after her match winning strike against Sligo Rovers at the weekend. She'll be up in just a couple of moments. Uh, match winning strike in the, the sixth or seventh minute of a match. Not a bad trick, uh, but it is what it is. We'll chat and get her thoughts on that later on in the program. But Aaron, I suppose it's been a weekend of interesting games. Um, some, a really good performance from Trady against DLR to, to get a point. We'll talk maybe about a penalty opportunity in that game, uh, which maybe could have seen them nick, nick all three just at the death. Plenty of penalty discussions this week. We're going to talk about referees later in the program as well. Could uh, Wexford have rescued a draw with a penalty in the last minute? Uh, we'll chat about that. And then maybe an interesting sending off situation that we actually think, on hindsight, that maybe the referees got right. But we'll talk about that later on in the program. Um, Aaron, your highlights of the weekend, uh, where were you? What were your thoughts on the games? I was I was in P Mount. I went to watch P Mount and Wexford. I thought P Mount's resilience was was actually quite good considering years gone by, they probably would have lost that game to Wexford and like even look at last year they, they let them back into the game. I thought DLR I was for me probably the highlight of the weekend is probably DLR Waves, just the fact that uh, not the sorry not DLR said three to United the fact that they got the, the point against DLR I think that's a big point and the Galway train continues to go on, and there was there was many positives the weekend. I think, like we'll get into each game in particular, and we'll chat through, through the games in more detail. But for me, I think Treaty Treaty's result and the fact that Galway's momentum keeps going is is, is an interesting sign. Yeah, as well, four wins for Galway this season, uh, with only eight goals in the four column, which is a, a big enough achievement really in itself. Uh, it's been an interesting kind of season so far for them. Couple of swapping one one nil victories and defeats in the early ch- um, exchanges of the season, but they've they've really grown into it. And I suppose uh, no better time really than to bring in um, Jenna Slattery, who's going to join us. Jenna, you're very very welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me. It's our pleasure to have you, and I suppose it's been a an interesting start to the season for Galway, as we mentioned. Um, did you expect when you joined Galway United from Galway WFC that you'd be in this position? at almost the first round of games done uh, in the top four in the league? Yeah, look, you never go into a league doubting your t- yourself and your team. You always go in with high expectations. And when we started in pre-season, that's what we had. We had high expectations that we were going to go try win trophies this season, gel as a team together and try to get the best out of each and one, every one of us. And that's what we've done so far. And there's still a, a lot more to come from us, but we're only at the start. In terms of the squad, though, Phil Trill obviously was involved last year with the, with the management side, but what's it been like with him taking over at the helm and, you know, getting the early results of the season? It must have been a, a big positive. Yeah, look, Phil's a great manager. We we all have great time for him. Like, we went into this season with a new style of play co- compared to last year, and it seems to suit all of us because we're all a great bunch of talented um, girls. And look, that style of play seems to suit us. We want to play football. That's what we're here for. And we've we've done that so far, and we're going to keep pushing on and keep playing football. Looking at the game last week, of course, first time uh, Sligo Rovers faced Galway this season. They made the journey down. A couple of players on either side have played for both clubs. Uh, Jim and McGuinness, probably the most high-profile defection over the close season. Um, there's no love lost, I'd imagine, on the field, despite probably most of you been friendly off. Yeah, I know there wasn't. Like Sligo's always going to be a tough battle. A Connacht derby, like, there's nothing better than a derby game. And look, Sligo are a great team. They've really put in the performance. But we were lucky enough, we got the win. And that's all that really mattered. But for you, though, the early start, obviously, Kay Thompson getting the first goal. And then yourself popping up, who actually started the move for the second goal by playing the ball out to Kay. And then continue to run into the box. Tuning up early on, probably in a bit of dreamland. Maybe a little bit disappointed, didn't see the game out a little bit easier. Yeah, look, that's what we're struggling at, but we'll bounce back from that. We start the games really well, but we just need to keep consistent now. Going through the whole 90 minutes, we've talked. We're going to we're gonna build again. We've built this week. We're going to go on against DLR now this weekend and try to keep co- that consistency from the first whistle to the very end. I was watching the highlights back of the game. I don't think I've ever seen anybody as happy to be on a football pitch as Kate Thompson after she scored the first goal. It's <laughs> literally from ear to ear. Um yeah. 
it must be good in the camp at the moment. A new club, a bit of an enthusiasm. Maybe that was the club was struggling to keep towards the end of last year. I know we, we heard about kind of financial issues and stuff in the old setup. Uh, it must be lovely to be in that new environment, um, new players, new, despite a lot of it being quite similar, just that little bit of freshness to it. Uh, and really, it seems like a squad that's enjoying themselves. Yeah, 100%. Like, we're such a young team, but I think that's what really helps us because we all understand each other and it helps us gel together because we're that, we're that young of a team. And I wouldn't doubt us just being that young team. I wouldn't wouldn't doubt any bit, any bit of our ability, to be honest. Was it good to get the monkey off the back in terms of uh, home wins, especially under the Galway United banner because a draw and a defeat in the first two games at home? Nice to get that off. Yeah, we were disappointed with the loss against Bowes and then the draw against Rovers, but we had that belief in us to finally get that three points at home and we can't drop it from here. We talked about the differences. Tell us a little bit how it compares now to maybe last year. There's going to be differences. There's going to be things better, things not so good. How have you found that change and what's the, the major differences between this setup and, and last year's? Yeah, to be honest, there's not really much of a difference. Like We're still playing the name DC. We still have everyone backing us, but maybe there's just that bit more backing with Galway United. Um, the backroom staff, the management, the board, they're all behind us. And I have to give a shout out to the Maroon Army. They're at all our home games and even some of our away, green, away games. And they really like the support they give us is amazing. They're there from the start with the drums right until the end, right until we're cooling down. They're just amazing. So they've really helped us as well. You talked a little bit about the, the, you know, the change not being much. Was it difficult though towards the end of last season? And come and what sort of expectations did you put in coming into this year? Because obviously, when you get the news, Galway WSC are going, and then there was a bit of will Galway take it? Won't Galway take it? What was that like? Yeah, it was kind of hard at the start because we didn't really know what was going on. But once we heard Galway United were taking us over, like we'd no doubt in them. Like they're a great club. They've always been a great club at the men's side. So once we heard that news, it was kind of a bit of a like lift off the shoulder but we knew when we were going into Galway United we had like everyone was going to be backing us from the start and we'd no doubt in them. A couple of girls didn't make that move as well um there's a lot of more the experienced players who haven't gone over to Galway FC for various reasons life reasons uh, work reasons whatever it might be how much was it a concern coming into the season knowing that that experience, say the likes of Julian Russell, for example, or even Foy Singleton, who's here at Long, um, not having them in the dressing room and kind of players like yourself still in your teens having to grow into those leadership roles. Yeah, it's always going to be hard when you lose a few players, but I think the players that we brought in and the players that have stepped up from underage level to being senior, like it wasn't that hard to change over because we still had that, like we still have people coming in to take their spots, like everyone stepped up when there was needed to be stepped up and I think it really helped when they st when they did step up and they believed that they could do it that the change wasn't really much like you're you're going to miss the players that have gone behind and moved on but it's what's best for them uh, but then when the girls have stepped up they've done an incredible job and you can't fault them on you though nice start of the season three goals out of seven games scored another goal in Talca Park you're making a bit of a habit of that you scored the goal last year to get the equaliser then you scored a winner this year you seem to like playing there yeah look it's a great stadium to play in to be fair the, the fans up there they're they're mad but uh, it's just it's a good feeling when you score up there you just I don't know it sense like a bit of an ease as well as that over the last couple of seasons Obviously, you were involved with Treaty for two years prior to moving to, to Galway. You broke into the league with them. Um, how nice is it as a former player? I know they're in the league, they're comp competition as well, but how nice is it as a former player to see how well they're doing this year compared to uh, recent seasons? Yeah, look, it's 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 good for them, to be fair. Like, I was down there, like, it is tough when you're, you're not really getting what you wanted to get at the very start. And to see them improving, fair play to them, because they didn't give up. What's the differences, though, from, say, playing with a Galway to a Treaty when maybe expectations are slightly different on you? It's more, I think it's the backing that people have behind you. Like when you start the season strong and you're you're doing well, like uh, people are going to believe they are, they're going to do well. Like we came into the season with people thinking we were going to do well. We were such a young team. We won't challenge for 
much, but once we started that season strong and we put a word into people's mouths, then we it kind of shocked people and then they're like, oh, okay, go, we are going to put it up. So that's when we like people noticed that we're, we're battling for everything. Brefna, I was one of I was one of them. I won't lie. I was I was one of them. I've eaten oh, humble pie. We have a weekly delivery of humble pie to both our houses at this stage. It's we're well used to it. Uh, we get proven wrong every other week. It's brilliant, um, and, and we enjoy that. I know we 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 do make predictions. We do say stuff on the on the show. It's what we believe at the time, and then we get proven wrong. And it's quite. I like it. I, I quite enjoy it because I know in the rugby side of things here at Final Whistle. Uh, we had a club in round one of the league. We put them down as relegation fodder. Uh, it was a bit more pleasant than that. But they actually messaged us when they stayed up at the end of the season. Like they were mid table or fourth or fifth in the league, and they messaged us with the with the screenshot of the article and a, a little uh, like a emoji. And it was like, "On, oh, I love that. I absolutely love that." But it's it is what it is, and, and we continue to do that. But in terms of, I suppose, from yourself, from your own point of view, Jen, of course, it hasn't just been about domestic stuff over the last couple of weeks. Um, you've been involved in international setup, the 19 side. Uh, we've heard on the grapevine, we'll talk about the football in a minute, but we've heard on the grapevine that that under 19 dressing room is one of the most chaotic and crazy places to be. Uh, are there any stories you can tell us about uh, the hijinks that you get up to on international gym? Not, not really, to be fair. Like, you just have the girls and the music, oh, the, the music sometimes a bit, it's a bit chronic, but look the girls are unbelievable when you go into that setup and into the dressing room everyone's ready to go we're all heads on music's blaring you're just you're just focusing on the game but once the music and the girls are there like it it, it, it gives you a great feeling in you i can't not now brevin you've brought the topic of international football up jenna what's the jersey behind you i was i was i wanted to ask at the start it's, it's there's a pendant in front of the jersey though. it's just a small irish jersey right with a pen yeah, in front of it. Yeah. It's my Irish jersey from 17s. When nice. we were in Lithuania, yeah. How have you found the season so far? You're very young, so you only come in, you're only in the season, despite being in the league a few years and your name's been circulating as one of the players to watch over the last few seasons. Um, what's it what have you noticed over the last two or three years in terms of the league and, and where it's going and obviously the move to professionalism and stuff like that? You're very young. Is that something that might be in your future or have you given it thought? Ah, uh, yeah, it probably will be like I'm. Um, I'm gonna wait a few years. I think I'm gonna like like the season's been going really well for me, and that's what I want to do. I want to keep my performance consistent week in week out, develop myself, and then think about going other way. But for now, Galway United is where I am at, and every week I'm gonna keep performing for the club and hopefully I've developed myself a bit more and the players around me. It's a very diplomatic answer. I like it. <laughs> For someone who, for someone that was come into the league where social media is a massive presence, do you pay much attention to what's being written or what's being said on social media about whether yourself or Galway within the games, or do you just switch off, Mano? Uh, I look at it every now and again, but I would kind of mainly switch off from it. Social media doesn't really bother me. Like you know, you can give out about some things, you can agree with others, but social media to me means nothing. It's what you do on the pitch and what you believe in. What other your family your friends can see around you is what really matters what's the ambition for the season uh, what how close can Galway go to that league title personally I believe we can go to the very top but we just got to keep performance consistent week in week out we got to keep training hard develop each other gelling together we're now gelling together a lot better so we got to keep our performance consistent not dropping our levels throughout the game and I believe that we can we can be contenders for the ta- for the league, and but there's two there's a league cup and the All Ireland Cup, and we strongly believe that we have a squad there that can that can win it. Just on just on that though, like away form, as like Brefney mentioned, the under 19s away form seems to be a real asset for you. Is it the bus trip up, or that gets you all amped because you're just mm-hmm. spending a couple of hours together, or yeah. what is it? Because you ha- you've been you've been great on the road this season. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's kind of sometimes it's it's the way things go, but I think because we got our, I think we were just waiting to get our first home win for to, for us to kick off. And I think now that we've got that, I feel like no matter if it's a home or away game, we we'll be we'll be there to show up and hopefully get the win. Of course, DLR this weekend, and then a treaty that that one in Galway. You have to make it away to a home jerk game. <laughs> 
traveling from Limerick to, to play at Trinity <laughs> United. Um, how tough is it to get your head around that when you do have find yourself in that situation? Yeah, look, it's hard, like, uh, from being at a club for a few years to then moving and then playing against them. Look, it is tough, but at the end of the day, Galway's my club now, and I'll take every game that comes in my stride, and it won't affect my performance. I keep performing the way I'm going, and look, you, you can't really you can't really do much about it. You have all the girls in Treaty muted for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Will you read anything into the results recently? Like you look at your play got at DLR this weekend. Will you read anything into their results this weekend or how will you approach that game? Yeah, look, I'm big into analysis analyzing analyzing all the games and stuff. So I, I've watched back their games and I'll, I'll look at the stats and whatever, but I mainly focus on ourselves and how we can be better and what we can do to exploit them and to to get the win. Just depending on how things go at the weekend, you could be in second place in the table. Uh, again, depending on the results elsewhere, it, it's been a, a phenomenal start to, to life and go. I know I started the interview by asking more or less the same question, but is it has it gone better than you anticipated it might, or, or are you about where you thought you'd be? Um, I never really had doubts to be fair coming in this year, like. Preseason started, you're kind of like, oh, what way is it going to go? But once we started preseason well, we trained well, like we got our minutes in early, we got our games going. And once that first game hits and we played Wexford, knowing that Wexford were going to be contenders to the league and us losing slightly by a 1 0, it really shows that we could believe that we were really there to be contenders to the league. And I think that's what helped us as well. To, for us to realise where we actually stand in this league. Was the Bows one a difficult one to take? Because obviously the way the goal went in, a uh, deflection off Sarah Rowe, she'll claim it, but I don't think she knew much about it. Was that a difficult one to take, especially after the back of pushing Wexford so 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 far and getting the win against Cork? Yeah, definitely. Like it was it was a frustrating game, like but like we, we learned from it, we bounced back and that's what we gotta keep doing. We can't we can't dwell on the losses. We gotta we gotta focus on the next game and Try to see what we can do better to make their mistakes not happen. Speaking of bouncing, I want to talk to you about the goal down in Cork, right? <laughs> Long range free kick, bounced in the box, oh, in, just inside the post, past the keeper. Uh, I'm guessing that wasn't what you intended to do with that delivery. Ah, uh, well, look, you you kind of put it into the box, aiming for where you're going to go, and luckily that bounce helped me, and it went straight through. If I'm not mistaken, you made the team of the week as a centre back that week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, she was probably in her own half. <laughs> to be fair. This is when she started the run up. Uh, you've got those kind of nice uh, long range strikes in your arsenal, though. Like the game at the weekend against Sligo it was a nice, but edge of the box, ball comes back, and you just tuck it in. It was, it's something you're growing into in your game, kind of a bit of maturity. Just get the head down and get the technique right and finish the, the strike. Um, it's it's a side that we're seeing more and more out of you over the last couple of weeks. Do you feel that maturity growing on the pitch as well as off uh, in your in your own self? Yeah, one hundred percent. Like from even compared to last year, I feel like I'm a different person on the pitch. I'm um, I really started my season the way I wanted it. Last season was kind of a bit rough at times, but to keep that consistency going, me like I'm happy where I'm at. But I know that there's still another level in me that I need to get to. Interested though, did you do anything differently though in the off season to, to bring it on or was it just the experience? Yeah, like I think the like the off season this year, like I was last season was a bit difficult because I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I was kind of jumping to, to, between training sessions and then for this year to be settled down in Gaw United, uh with the management that we have, the the preseason we had, I think that's what has helped me had a, such a good start. But it's not that, like it's off the pitch as well, what I'm doing at home, my family, what they're back they're back at me the whole way. And I think, yeah, the off season probably did help me, but that's still if I had a good off season doesn't mean that my start of my season would have went well. So I had to still keep that going while when the season started. In terms of the start of the season, um obviously go out WFC pulled out of the league last year, replaced by Galway United. Um other girls went elsewhere. You have been at other clubs before. Did it cross your mind to go elsewhere or was it always going to be Galway United for you? Um, well, yeah, it's going to cross my mind at some stages. Like, 
I was with somewhere else, but I felt coming into Galway United, I think it was the best next challenge for me. I felt like the the players when they when I went there, like you you could see that they really welcomed you. You were really wanted there, and I think that's what helped me settle there. Especially it's so it's it's close enough from home. So when I was doing my leave in cert, it was it was a good move for me. You talked a little bit about, you know, when Breffney asked about moving clubs and stuff like that. I assume because we're only looking from the, from the outside in, because we, when you see social media, transfers are sort of being dripped and drabbed. You would have probably would just have had much of a meeting before the see, before preseason just to say, this is who we've got, just so you knew what was going on. Because it seemed to us as that, you know, it was coming out late and dry. We didn't, you'd, you'd always assume that the players were signed early. Is that for this season? This season. Um, no, not really. Like, had had chat to Phil, but that's what you're gonna do with every manager starting the preseason. See what what they what they're more like, what they're interested in, and what they see that's going forward. And it's mainly the club's expectations and the platforms that it's gonna bring you. And that's kind of it, really. Yeah. So we can't expect to see Jenna Slattery announced by like six different clubs next week. <laughs> <laughs> three days are going to be announced by Trini, Galway, at those five. <laughs> Listen, Jenna, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, for your company this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. The very best of luck uh, in DLR at the weekend and, of course, for the rest of the season, whatever that might bring. Any chance we might see you make a last late burst and get your name on a, a plane to Australia? Is that, uh, has that crossed your mind as well? Yeah, look, it's always going to cross your mind. Like, it's... The team is so hard to get into, but like, what a what a feeling for it to be if I was named on that plane. But fingers are crossed. But we have gotta keep working hard. We gotta keep the level of where I'm at and keep pushing myself. And maybe if it's not this year, maybe it's in the next few years. But it's gonna be always my ambition. Have you got flights booked? Do you go on yourself? No. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned. Better <laughs> best look of the weekend, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Jenna Slattery there, a uh, very composed and mature young lady. Um, she's got her wits about her, Aaron. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think just in terms of when you mention the flights, where I think you're trying to find someone else who's not going like you. I, mean, I, I, know. <laughs> I found a soulmate. I'm good, yeah. <laughs> just uh, the, the one thing I took away from, from, from Jenna just there is, and I sort of made a little note over here, is dedication yeah. and attitude. To me, that's... If you've got half the ability that you've got and you've got attitude and dedication to bring you along, the thing about Jen is Jen is a smashing, smashing young player and I think she'll she'll continue to grow. And like, listen, you talked about the the, the the longer range goals. I was on commentary last year when she scored the goal against Shelburne when she when she looped Amanda Wooden from 25, 30 yards. And you just, you, you always knew when she got in a little bit of space, she was dangerous. And I think She's a big player for Galway this year. I wouldn't be surprised if she's if she's there thereabouts for the club's player of the year this year because ultra consistent and Galway need players like that if they want to keep getting results. They're barely a third of the way through the season, but I can see it head in that direction. Absolutely. She's got three out of their eight goals so far uh, from a non kind of attacking point of view is, is, is pretty good. Uh, we talked a little bit with Jenna and, and beforehand uh, about the Sligo game. You mentioned it briefly in the interview. Um, Galway two up within the first seven or eight minutes and only just winning two one. Is that a bit of a is that a bit of a worry for them that they're not maybe putting teams that they should be putting to the sword quite fully across uh, the line? Well you've just you've just you've hit the nail on the head there a minute ago when you said eight, eight goals in seven games. That's that's the concern. Like the first couple of games were either were either one 0 wins or one 0 losses. Like the first three games they scored one goal and it's been sort of the rest uh, six seven goals in the in them last four games yes it's a bit of a it's a bit of a concern but you you sort of you'd wonder you know, at that sort of stage did a little bit of composure maybe drop out a little bit but from a Sligo Rovers point of view Emma Doherty obviously with the with the Sligo goal and things he been worse for Sligo but it's 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 same like I said last week with 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 Shelburne against Treaty Shells just be happy to walk away with the three points and say yeah. go would be the same yeah, fair enough. It does keep them fourth in the table. Uh, we mentioned Chloe Singleton in that interview, of course, former Galway WFC player, as same as uh, as Jenna, but she got on the score sheet for Atlone Town, 2-0 winners against Cork City. Um, our good luck streak struck again. I um, Dana Sh- Sheriff with a, a, I suppose, the the ice, what would you call it, the uh, ice on the cake, uh, 10 minutes in time with a great effort. She ran onto a through ball and just uh, buried right. a really good finish. 
was it was it a was it a great effort or it was just an absolute gaping hole in the cork defense that was just and I she was just trying saved. To nice. I was but trying to be nice, Aaron. Come here. I, I picked up though, even on the first goal, they let the ball bounce before before Chloe comes and strikes it as well. Like it's for me, it's probably t- it's two defensive errors for for the goals. Yes, Chloe strikes it well, but the ball shouldn't be allowed to bounce there. And I think it's when things aren't going your way, sort of them sort of errors creep into your game. And it's been a difficult season for Cork, but Atlone are getting that little bit of they're getting that bit of momentum. Dane is getting a, a couple of more minutes. Maybe this week she might be in contention to play even a little bit more. Maybe start the game and the like core Maddie Gibson. I think will run will run, run, run a bit of riot when they get when they get linked together, but. Another good win for Athlone, for Cork, the, the struggles just keep going and it's going to be tough to turn that around. But isn't it great to see the league now where you're at the stage where you make a mistake, you can see the goal and the quality of the teams are so good that you can't afford to make those mistakes anymore. But that used to only happen with three teams. It used to only happen with the top three teams, where now it's happening with a lot more teams. And I think when, when we talk about the, the Bows and Robbers game, we'll talk about the exact same thing at times as well. And I think you're right, it's great because... It means teams have to be fully focused. They can't afford to be switched off, otherwise they're going to get punished. Absolutely. Moving on to another game, we might jump to that Shamrock Rovers Bowls game, um, the traditional Dublin Derby. I'm going to get hammered for saying that, but it is the traditional Dublin Derby in the men's game. First time that sides have met in senior competition. Of course, Rovers were in the league uh, at, the, at the outset, but Bowls weren't, and now they're the first time they've both faced off against each other. A uh, great setting, Tallis Stadium as always. It's a great cauldron of football for a game like that um, Shamrock Rovers would be really happy with, with the outcome really they were just clinical yeah they were they were very good but just on that can we really call it an actual proper derby because it's it there's no real I don't think there's any tension in the women's side of it that's why it's a little bit whereas P-Mount and Shells was, okay. was always ten, you know And but for me yeah Rovers Rovers were very good Um Abby Larkin obviously getting her first goal for Rovers, probably a bit disappointed how long it's taken. Jess Gargan making a little bit of a habit of scoring goals. She scored the, the header against Wexford and then scores another brilliant header against against Bowles with a, a superb free kick from Jamie Thompson. The Peno, yeah, it's handball. Um it's poor, it's poor, poor to give away. Then obviously Abby finishes her goal very well. But for me, the defender for the fourth goal is quite poor. They get themselves in six and sevens and they get capitalized on and it's a nice finish then in the end. It's a nice finish in the end from Anya. But she's the one thing, she scored harder goals, to be fair. Like that yeah. was exactly one of the hardest goals she's ever had to took away in the back in the back. But of the, the one the one thing I did I did take note of from that game is that I still think Bowles have a bit of a fear factor when they played the likes of Shells and they played the played Rovers. This like at times they don't come out and deliver the performances. Like I said last week, they'd have to be on their A game to to deliver a performance last on Saturday. Saturday wasn't on their A game. Saturday they were punished for being below and that's the if you want to if they want to break the top four, they want to break in and around that. They're going to have to be on their A game when they come up against these sort of sides and get results because realistically shipping four against Shamrock Rovers and I know the management team won't be happy with that and it's it's a, it's a difficult one because coming off the, coming off the coming into the game where you're sort of thinking we can maybe get something to maybe get being put back down into reality a little bit. Yeah, I think so. In, in terms of the final two games of the season, let's maybe take them together. We've already kind of dealt with the, the DLR Treaty game at the very outset of the show, but there's one particular incident we want to talk about. I did flag at the very top. We're going to talk about refereeing across both of these because we've had a few messages in asking us to take a look at stuff and maybe share our opinions on on um, or maybe validate someone else's opinions in their head of, of uh, particular instances. Let's start. DLR, or DLR Treaty... Uh, at home in the markets field, Treaty, they've played seven games, I suppose on a positive note, they've only lost four. Last year that would have been six or seven. Um, it's a good season comparative to where they were last year. Is that fair to say? It's yeah, it's much better. But like last year, last year, like you, you think when they ship six against Roberts, they ship eight against Athlone, you're thinking, oh no, here's another here's another thing all over again. Then they come and beat Sligo, they get the draw with Cork. They lose one nil to shells. Another draw here. Like they're building a good bit of momentum defensively. They've been very good lately, and that's probably the biggest. That's the big, big positive for me. Yes, there's a lot of work to do up the other end of the field, but you need to get the the basics right at the back, and that'll sort of allow them to grow a little bit more. But I just think from them, like you have to be happy where if you're if you're a treaty fan, you have to be happy where they were this season, where they are at the moment, considering where they were. Now, and let's talk about the penalty. First of all, the build-up, uh, we won't talk about the defending. I don't think players of the calibre of Jess Gleason and Eve Badana need to be told 
they were a bit lax days club on the defending for the opportunity but the actual opportunity itself uh, we can't show the highlights we do have a still in a minute but um hannah saidi nips in between the two um players from dlr gets a cross in blocked by jess gleason definite calls for a handball your thoughts it's it's a tough one because it probably by the letter of the law it probably is but i don't think there was intent in it that's the thing and i don't think like she doesn't clearly go and raise her hand up really really high to try and you know block it it sort of comes up when she's trying to bring the foot up a little bit it's a tough it's a tough one it's probably on the edge of the box as well but mm, it probably is a penalty but it's one of them that you see them giving you see them don't giving it's for me it's not a it's not probably not a stonewall penalty yeah, I think I'd echo that. We've just a, a big bit of a still here. It's a minute and a bit into injury time. Uh, you can see Jess Gleason is in the box just. Uh, the cross comes in. It hits her right hand, the one furthest from the, the ball as it ha happens. It appears to hit her arm. We still have, from this camera angle, you can't really tell. Um, and I think you're right. I think you've seen them given. I've seen them not given. I don't think you could have an argument either way. I, the only thing is, yeah, and I, I said to you, all, I said to you all fair, but the only thing for me is, I would like to see a clinical forward actually score that before it even goes wide. But from the, the decision, it's, it's, you, we see them giving, we see them not giving. For me, that was a late chance that if she got that touch right, she buries that into the back of the net and treaty, treaty win, treaty win one nil, and then they're, they're off with a, with a happy result. But when it's not given, you understand why people are calling for it and things like that. But it, it's not one that I'd say is a stone ball. Now, talking about other penalty opportunities, one caught my eye as I was watching through the highlights of the, the P Mount Wexford game. Now, the highlights discussion is a whole different animal. I have so many issues with the highlights. Some in some ways it's brilliant, in other ways, it doesn't include the actual highlights. It's like someone just says, Okay, there's a goal, clip that, clip that, clip that. It's very little extra. They did put in the extras, they put in a sending off. We'll come back to that in a minute. That's Kira Rossler. We got her marching orders the first minute of injury time in that game as well. But this one happens very late on, eight minutes into injury time. Pima one goal up against Wexford. Wexford down a player. And as you can see, just inside the box. Again, these are a bit blurry. They are screenshots from LOI TV. Uh, go back and take a look at them if you have a season pass or if you watch the game. But um, I think I believe that's Karen Duggan, uh, for, if memory serves me right, um, on the edge of the box. Again, there's a tussle in, in, for the ball. I've seen them given. I've not seen them given. Your thoughts? I didn't think on, on Saturday when I initially seen it. I didn't think. I didn't think it was a penalty at that when I initially seen it on the day. I was down that end of the down that end of the ground. I didn't think it was. But like there was a couple of calls of penalty calls. The one in the build up to the the Karen Duggan goal as well in the, in the box that could have easily been given a, as a penalty as well. It was it was one where it's it's. The, the problem is, is there was a lot of. I think the referee let it, let it, let a good bit go in that game in terms of physicality. So you you sort of seen when he was towing the line where some of the challenges being borderline free kicks are not that he, you probably weren't going to get a, a soft penalty against him. It was going to have to be a st a clear stonewall penalty for him to actually give it. And he tried to let the game go because both sides both sides like to play the game physical at times. And I think the referee sort of realised that and let them have a little bit. There was. Like for me, I didn't think it was a penalty, and look, looking back at it, it's I think it'd be a harsh penalty to give. But the only thing I will say, and we'll talk about Kira Rossler's red card in a minute, is that Wexford did have chances though. When you see them when they break in on the counter attack, they were breaking in numbers, but the final pass again just let them down, and they just couldn't really, couldn't really get in. And like Emily Carver had a, had a couple of chances where she was slipped in, but and then she just, they just couldn't pee out and recovered. Like the one thing you take away from the game from a P-Man point of view is like, there's, I've, I put a picture on social media of Neary Burke chasing to to, to, to to not let a ball go out for a corner, to put it out for a goal kick. And it was just a determination. And I think that for me was evident from the p -Man side that they worked very, very hard. Young Jess Fitzgerald in midfield. Brefney, oh my God, she was brilliant. She's only 16. She's only 16. She was fantastic in the centre midfield. On Kylie Murphy for quite a lot of the game. Kept her and Adele Kennedy quiet enough in the game. And like, the, the Wexford goal comes from a from a P-Mount throwing. The, Rihanna Jarrah wins the ball, get, plays a 1-2 with Kylie Murphy and a lovely finish, but Rihanna has to go off then after 55, 55 58 minutes after being down twice with a, with a niggle, and then she's replaced by Emily Corbett, who was on who was on the bench, and you sort of think then 
P-Man started to take over a little bit. The first goal, maybe Maeve Williams won't really want to look at it back. She sort of pushed the ball up in the, into the air to an Aaron McLaughlin close for at home, close range. And then the Karen Duggan, the Karen Duggan, it was the ball wasn't clear properly. There was a, the the goal, it was a call for handball in the box that eventually worked out, curled into the far corner. A lovely finish from the P-Man skipper. But like, even she said to me after the game, she was like, these are the sort of games we would have lost last year, whereas that's the sort of mentality. I think the hunger is there. I think the Shells game sort of bit them a little bit and they bounced back superbly. But from a Wexford side, you'd be worried at the minute just with the way the results are going with three defeats on, on, the, on the spin. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange league position to see them in all right uh, after a third of the season gone. Um, the final thing we're going to talk about in terms of the games last weekend is, of course, that red card for Kira Roster. Now, I caught this on the highlights. Uh, I didn't watch the full game through. Um, the highlights, I'm not going to get into it because it will just, I, my blood will boil, but I just think... I didn't catch it. I did, for the audience, before you say anything, I didn't catch it live. Voice was actually sent off. So okay. the fact you've actually you've caught it on the you caught yeah. on the highlights. Well, I caught, I caught on the highlights that she was sent off, and I was like, on it didn't show it, and it just showed her being shown a red card, mm-hmm. and I was like, why has she got a red card? And I went into the game, went back and looked at, I couldn't see anything. There was a whole ball of nothing. and Jenna, Jenna Burrow got in or got injured and uh, stretching for a ball, getting a minute or two's treatment. Uh, they got up and he went and he booked somebody. Um, Chloe Maloney. Yeah, Chloe Maloney got booked um, ultimately for kicking the ball away. That was kind of obvious when you watched the, the thing back, but it, you had to really notice it. And but when it, I went a bit forensic, I'm not going to lie. I'm watching too many cop shows this weather. And she was booked in the first half. This is on 40, 41 minutes, and you can see the ref on the far side of the field. For um, a bit of... For a bit of context for the listener, she was booked because there was a couple of she'd committed a couple of fouls as well. And like the referee sort of said to her, Listen, anymore, I'm gonna have to book you. And she had another one there and she was she was booked for that. So like she had been given a pre warning. The second one is sort of well one let's for- jump to the red card first, because it just shows it's been a red card. There's nothing has mm-hmm. happened for about a minute and a half at this stage. Yeah. Uh, except the booking of Chloe Maloney. Um Jed has been getting treatment and the free kick hasn't happened, play hasn't resumed yet. And everyone's kind of talking about you can hear the fourth official very vocal on the sideline. So when I said this to you originally, you told me, because your understanding of it been at the game was the fourth official got her sent off, right? Yeah. But actually, I did a bit of forensic research, and here we go. You can see she's getting a yellow card. This is seconds after the seconds after the um the foul. The handball happened around Emily Corbett handled the ball just beside Jedders on the ground. Chloe Maloney on the edge of the box at the very top left there has just kicked the ball away. So it's literally in the aftermath. And it's obvious Kira Rossler has done something the referee doesn't like. I would I, I wonder how she said something about I, Chloe kicking the ball away. Yeah, I'd imagine she has said something or called for a yellow card or maybe criticized the ref for uh for the um for the handball because she may or may not have seen it. We don't know. We are completely and utterly uh and only that I went back and like slowly watched it through, the camera pans away really quickly. And if you don't see it there in the split second, you miss it. Um and that's why she was sent off the Language from the fourth official, if you listen closely, you can actually hear what he's saying. He's reminding the referee who has flashed two yellow cards and the fourth official has reminded him which players. He's gone and checked his notebook, realised he's already booked Kira Rossiter and he's then sent her off a minute and a half later. So but, out of context, it looks like he's just randomly picked her out of the line. But there was another There was another incident. I don't, know if it, I don't know if it's for the Chloe Maloney one or slightly earlier in the game. It might be for the Chloe one as well where the fourth official is actually directing what player to book as well because the referee sorry oh, it's it's Chloe Maloney's yeah yeah it's so he, he's he actually, kept, yeah so he has called for it there but the, he did keep a note of the uh, he did keep a note of the first book and instructed him on the second book and and then the referee realized and, and corrected it for the for the red card. Well I, I, I think I, we, we criticize referees on this show from time to time when it's warranted and I think to be fair they probably got it right. I can't speak to the actual incident but they got the logistics correct. of it correct. Yeah. And the fact that the fact that Jedda was getting treatment and and Dave there was eventually a sub sort of gave him that opportunity to get that right because you'd you'd worry if he books her and then play starts quickly he might he mightn't have realised. You know. Well, if say he misses that and they do get and they get the penalty that they could have got five minutes later, who's likely to be taking that penalty? It's either Kyler Murphy or Kira Rosser for me. I just mean so she could end up rescuing a point despite not supposed to be been on the pitch. Anyway, the actual game itself, you were at it. What do you think? It was it was a high 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 pace, high intense game. Um you could feel the nervousness a little bit within the exercise, obviously having 
haven't lost a couple of games and when when they when they go one up when they go one up one even before they go one the first half the chances where they were getting wide they were having a lot of success getting wide and getting balls into the box but it was just they couldn't really get anybody on the end of it probably a little bit lucky not to go behind in the first half Abby Brophy across a low cross comes in Abby Brophy back in, in centre half just with the way things fell at the, at the at that specific time sort of gets a little bit of a touch on it and Maeve Williams reacted quite quickly to keep it out but it, like. It's half time, you're probably thinking nil all, yeah, probably a fair result. But second half, when Wexford scored, you were thinking, right, they might kick on. But Pima just gradually, gradually grew into the game. And as as they continued to push forward, when, when they got the first goal, to me, it looked, it was, it was, it was looking as if it was only going to be Pima who would get the second goal. And they would drive on because they were pushing and pushing and pushing. Where every time Wexford were forward, they weren't really making Nevi Burke make big saves or make put put her under big pressure in it. For me, it, it was a sign of the. You can see P Mount; they're a really fit team this year. They they were able to keep going for the for the ninety minutes. But as I said earlier, I was really impressed with young Jess Fitzgerald in the mid, in the middle. It was only her second. I think it was only her second start for the for the team, and like she was a, she was really really good. It was interesting to watch James O'Callaghan actually coaching her after the game, showing you should have done, showing her what she why, where she could have done things slightly differently. And like realistically, when they come to this weekend. We'll chat about the fixtures, but there's no, there's no, there's gonna be no team talk needed this weekend for P Mount. And there's, there's well, it's probably the, the right game to have after the international break. A, a really, really tough test to really put them, put them back on the, on, 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 on a good keel. Well, they're not playing anybody interesting this weekend, are they? We'll be talking about all of the comings and goings from PRL Park uh, in just a couple of moments. We will just wrap up with a look back at all the fixtures or the results of the weekend. Galway United 2 1 winners over Sligo Rovers. Jenna Slattery, our guest tonight, one of the, the match winning goal scorer in the first 10 minutes of that game. Treaty and DLR scored a straw down in the markets field, while Piemont United, that 2 1 win over Wexford Youths in PRL Park, and Bowes, un- unfortunately for them, point of view. Beaten four 0 at Tallis Stadium by Shamrock Rovers by that. Definitely, if you look there, four home, four home wins. Only three were the only home team not to win at the weekend. Yeah, exactly, Athlone Town two 0 winners over Cork City there in the Athlone Town Stadium. Looking at the league table, what effect that has on it? Uh, Pima four points clear at the top of the table. One game played more than most of their rivals at the top of the the eleven team table at the moment. Shamrock Rovers their um, visitors on Saturday are second in the table, fourteen points. Uh, four behind Piedmont, while Shells and Galway United sit on 13. At lone three further back on 10, while Bowes, DLR Waves, Wexford Utes and Treaty United, uh, more or less one point to separate each of them, nine, eight, six and five respectively, while Cork City and Sligo Rovers will be hoping to break their duck uh, this weekend. It's a, a big ask, but um, they will be hoping to maybe uh, go one better than they have done so far. Uh, Cork host Bohemian Sligo Rovers host at Lone Town again. Another club with uh, plenty of familiarity between the two dress rooms there. In terms of top scorers in the league, Kate Mooney says on five on your Romans, two goals put her up to five points or uh, five goals, should I say, after six games. Uh, while Jesse Stapleton and Megan Spetlich and Dana Sher- Sheriff uh, on four points. Sheriff, the only one of those who got on the score sheet last week, Shells. I think they were idle last week. They were indeed. Um, and then Karen Duggan and Jenna Slattery, obviously, with goals last weekend. Chloe Singleton also got one. Rihanna Jarrett, she also got a goal. Jess Gargan on two. And Kayla Hamrick uh, on two at the end. She, uh, they didn't. Emma Doherty, that, sorry, picked up a goal as well. Her second. That's some, that's some goals per game for, for Dana Sheriff at the minute. I think goals per minute is really. Oh, goals impressive. per minute, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a goal every half hour. That's a hat trick a game. You know, it's not it's not bad going. Um, but that's where we are at the moment in terms of people putting the ball in the back of the net and those trying to keep the ball out of the back of the net. Eva Dana's clean sheet puts her top of the charts at the moment. Four, four clean sheets from six. Can you imagine? Uh, it's not going all DLR's waves this season this so far. This this is seventh place. Uh, could you imagine what it would be like if they didn't have her in nets for them at the moment? It could be a real struggle. Only six times they found the onion bag themselves. Four goals conceded uh, so far this year. Any other clean sheets last week that, that spring to mind? Uh, Nyla Peterkin got her second one of the season, while Anne-Marie Uliak, if I've pronounced that wrong, I apologise, uh, her first clean sheet of the season. Treaty are off the mark. Uh, nine clubs represented there, despite there being 11 players on the on the list, nine of the 11 clubs have kept shutouts so far this season, just Sligo and, and Cork 
to get uh, off the mark in that respect. But uh, some really impressive performances. And it's interesting to see the likes of Eve Badana at the top of the table, her side struggling in the league, while Abigail Ronayan, while maybe not necessarily keeping clean sheets, playing as part of a very uh, comfortable fourth place side in the league at Mundar. Yeah, it's the we always said at the start of the season that Eve Bandana be there or thereabouts in terms of if DLR is to be anywhere these like the fact that she's kept four clean sheets already considering they, where DLR are, it's it's quite it's quite impressive. It's quite impressive and I think a lot has to a lot of credit has to go to not just her to the DLOS defence because we probably thought that they'd ship quite a lot of a lot of goals, but they're, they're holding tall. They're holding tall. It'd be interesting to see what they do this weekend if they if they can hold out again. But like he was a top top goalkeeper. There's a reason why she was capped for Ireland. Like in terms of as you say, at the likes of Abigail Renane. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say if you offer you Ab- Abigail out, uh, just if you know, I'm just saying if you if you offer if you offer a, a keeper like that down that sort of end of the table, they'd say okay, I'll take no clean sheets. But if you give me fourth place. You give me third place. You give me you give me so many wins. I don't care I'll, I'll, if I can see the goal, but we win the game. That's it, you know. And I think that's that that's sort of the the way the way it's it's working with some of the keepers higher up that conceding goals, but they're still winning games. I know Abigail she wants clean sheets as well, but it is what it is. In terms of fixtures this weekend, of course, DLR Waves and actually again they host Skull United, both keepers up against each other. What are the odds on a nil-nil draw in that particular game? DLR, they like a nil-nil draw in Belfield. Uh P Match United host Shamrock Rovers. That's probably my tie of the weekend. We'll talk about all these games in just a couple of moments. Cork City hosts Bows and Turnish Cross at five o'clock, while Sligo Rovers and and at the moment, uh, meet in the showgrounds also at five o'clock kickoff. While Shelburne make the journey down south to Wexford Youths, another tough task for Wexford Youths. Uh, obviously, one game stands out in terms of for a whole lot of reasons. The top two t- teams in the table, there is obviously a, a narrative been ongoing for weeks about where players are going to and from from the towards the tail end of last season. Um, are you going to go to PRL Park on Saturday? Oh, there's no, there's no place I won't. There's no place I'd rather be on Saturday. And that's that's the one destination it has to be. Uh, the tension will be the tension will be huge. Like listening to James O'Callaghan after the game, sort of saying, "Listen, if I was to, if I was to give you motivation for next week, considering what's going on, I don't think they, I don't think you'll have to motivate him at all." I'm really, really interested to see how Karen Duggan gets on this week in terms of the way she's been playing. I wouldn't be surprised if she bosses the midfield as well and she she really puts the Rovers midfield under pressure. Whereas they may have to do something slightly different because again against Shells, they sort of at times when Shells boss the midfield, they struggled, but they were creative going boy at the, at the, out wide against Shells, and that's sort of what helped unlock them. P I think will be a, a different animal with the with the form they're in, the the ex players going back. There'll be a lot of a lot of spice, a lot of a lot of heat and I think tensions will will rise high. The only thing I will say is good luck to the referee because there's no doubt that it's going to be a difficult it'll be a difficult game to referee just in terms of the emotions will be high. Just I just I think it'll be it'll be close. If P Mount can win this, it'll really set a stall out. If Shamrock Rovers win it, they'll obviously go top, and then then even more questions to be no, asked no, about. The four points behind. The four points behind. So P- P- yeah, they've given hand, but P Mount have that four point cushion. Uh, I could be wrong. The league table could be wrong. If it is, I apologise. Uh, I'm just double checking it here now. But uh, the you could be right. I am. I'm right. <laughs> uh, I won't sack the researcher just yet. Uh, <laughs> I'll have a tomorrow. But no, it, it's a case of um, the like if PR win that game at the weekend, there's a hypothetically a not unrealistic situation where Galway might only get a draw in in DLR. Uh, Shells down in Wexford may only pick up a point. Um, that like that's not unrealistic in terms of expectations. Pima could have a seven point lead if they were to win, <laughs> with only twelve games left to go in the title race. Um, that's pretty. That would be a huge statement, given how the close season went for that club. That yeah. would be a huge statement. Yeah, but I think I think the way the close seasons went has actually made them stronger as a group. I think that's for that's for sure. The only concern from a PMA point of view is obviously Carla McManus has torn her ACL and it's gonna it will miss the rest of the season. So that's that's a bit of a loss for them. But Kate Mooney sort of worked hard and, and led the line. So the thing is they're bringing in some younger players. They're giving some other younger players a chance as well this year in terms of PMA. 
the one surprise is that Jenna Beryl is playing centre back, but she was actually quite good at considering we'd be more used to seeing her playing on, on the wing, but she was very, very good for them. Like Piemont, they have a lot of experience, they have a lot of they have a lot of goal, they have a lot of nose. Um there's no doubt that James O'Callaghan will be in will be in the airs as the likes of Collie O'Neill at the weekend. Can Roberts keep composed is the question. Will what sort of crowd will go out to P Man for that game? But I think it's it's a game that I think it's definitely the title around for me. But sometimes we say that we build these sort of games up and then it might it mightn't even live up to it at all. And you just hope it does live up to it because we, we built the Shells game up against Shamrock Rovers and that really li- that really lived up to it. So you'd be hoping that this does again and like there's no doubt that the P Man talk will all week will be the players that have gone, you know, we need to put in a performance from from the likes of Anya, though, it's it's just another day for Anya. She's left before. She went to DLR, to UCD Waves before. So for her coming back, she's done it before in the opposite dressing room. It's just going to be like a, another day. In terms of the other games, Wexford and Shells, that uh, had, would have been a, a top-of-the-table clash in, in previous seasons. Um, the way Wexford season's going, it's almost a must-win for them. Oh, absolutely! It's a must win. Absolutely, it's a must win. If they if they fail to pick up three points in this game, they're really going to get cut. Adri- they're really going to get cut adrift. Yes, they've got the two games in hand, but as as the old saying goes, points in the border are a lot better, and especially at this stage when when you're coming off the back of run run of defeats. Like the thing for me is, yes, they showed a lot of hunger and a lot of ter- a lot of a lot of grit against P Mount, but it was just the final tour is just lacking a little bit, like. You'd, you'd wonder is Rihanna Jarrett going to be fit having come off the pitch? She probably she probably will be. It might have just been a bit of fatigue because of the, the intensity of the game. But Emily Corbett on the bench at the bench at the weekend. What's Emily thinking there? Coming after making the move, Matt Lones, a player of the year last year, sitting on the bench. Things maybe not working the way she would have wanted. It's 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 going to be a bit. It's going to be tough for Wexford to turn that corner, and it'll be extreme. I think it'll be extremely difficult for, for them to do it this weekend. I I don't expect them to beat Chelsea. Yeah, interesting times ahead for that club. Uh, Sligo Rovers host that loan again. We've talked about players moving in both directions uh, over the years. Um, probably the most prominent one would be Myrna Devaney. Also, Kelsey Monroe would have played underage for Sligo as well. They're both now obviously featuring for Athlone this season. Um, your thoughts on, on where that's going to go? Are we looking at another Athlone win or can Sligo change their their, for, their form around? It's, it's been a poor run so far. I can't see Sligo. I can't see them changing it around. I just think Athlone are getting that that little bit of momentum going. Things are starting to to work for the players. Are starting to to really bet into the team, especially some of the new signings. And I have a feeling Athlone could win two or three nil in this game. Yeah, I'd worry my is that is that ball. your is that your choice at call the weekend? I, 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 I uh, that's where I'm going to be, but um, I I worry for Sligo over the next few weeks. I think uh, we're starting to see them getting further and further behind in terms of just maybe in terms of. What's the word I'm looking for? Kind of that um, energy levels and and determination just doesn't seem to be what it was last year. We saw them pull off some phenomenal results, deservedly phenomenal mm-hmm. results last year. I think they need something like that. I think Saturday is an opportunity against a team that's relatively close to them and geographically at least that they wouldn't be expected to beat for them to step up and go, do you know what? We beat Wexford here last year. We beat Shells here last year. You're the President's Cup holders. You finished, uh, you got to the FA Cup final. We're going to go out and take the game to you. Do they have it in the locker to do that? That remains to be seen. But I think it needs to happen. It needs to happen soon or Sligo could end up uh, with a pointless season. Uh, I hate saying that, but I think it could be where we end up, unfortunately. But that, that's a massive yeah. fear. Yeah. We they can't turn out momentum. They need to do something and something pretty quick. Uh, DLR and Goal, we touched on already. Um, your thoughts on that? I think it's going to go. I think it'll be. I think I think it'll be in a way win. I think Galway should with the with the form they've got. They've they're unbeaten now. They're now and saying that I've said that on the show. They're with the fact they've won all their away games. They'll probably come up and and slip up. But like for me, if DLR are to get something on it, they'll probably need Galway to be a little bit off off the pace and for them to be at top at top kilter. But it'll be a difficult one for DLR. I think Galway should be too strong for them. But listen, we've said a couple of things about DLR this season in terms of results, and they've surprised us so. I wouldn't be surprised if they do pick up a point, but I expect Galway to win. Yeah, they win that game as favourites. Another team going into a game away as favourites is probably Bohemians. They make the long journey down to Cork City and uh, turns across at 5 pm kickoff on Saturday evening. Uh, Bows, too much firepower for a Cork side struggling at the back? If they're switched on, if they're switched on, it's too much. If they're not, like we've seen what happened last year when they went down there. 
expected to win, get beaten two one down there. Sort of one of them games that you're thinking, right? Balls will win here. They'll kick on. They didn't last year. They have to be switched on. They have to be. They have to be ready to go. Yes, they have too much firepower. There's no doubt that the Bow squad is definitely better than the Cork squad. But the problem with Bows is that they're lacking a little bit of consistency at the minute. And if they don't have the consistent performance, then they will drop points down there. And it's just, like that's the problem. That's the worry about Bows is that they're not consistent enough for a top four, top a top four, top five finish. So this weekend is where they'll have to pick up the three points if they want if they want to be in that reckoning. Yeah, similar to Sligo, I think this could be a weekend, an opportunity for Cork to put a marker down and uh, to show the progress they've made under Danny Murphy. Um, because they have made progress, it just hasn't represented itself in the results just yet, in my opinion. Anyway, I think that's it for the week. Aaron, anything else before you do you want to give uh, referees another hammer and just No, finish? no, no. Listen, I, I, I was happy with the referee. I was happy with the referee out in in payment. The only thing I will say, and we, we sorry you sort of touched on it, is we don't know what Rossi said, so we can't make a judgment to whether it was a valid yellow card or it wasn't. But if he if he realizes she's already been booked, does he send her off or does he give her a second yellow? I'm not sure. But if she said something to antagonize him, you can you, you know you can't defend it. Yeah. And yeah. uh, we did also get a comment in about the referees, and uh, not necessarily about the, the quality of the referees, but the frequency that certain clubs are seeing certain referees. Um, one club saying that reached out to me anyway and saying that they had a their four home games have had the same referee three times. And just that they were concerned that it was maybe, I know referees is a problem, availability of referees is a problem, and particularly good referees at this level. Um, but it would be nice to see it a bit more shared out in terms of uh, that one referee. Not that they would, but that if there, it leaves them open to developing a set against a player or whatever. I don't believe that's a thing, but clubs do the, believe that's a thing. The problem is, is um, we see it so often, like I'm seeing the same referees at a, at a combined of the Dublin games. I'm seeing the same sort of pool of referees every week. It's every game. It's not necessarily, I don't know if they're just doing it because of geographic as well. I'd imagine like, so. It, it, it's, it's tough. Like, cause I know, I know they brought, I think your man, I think Mark Houlihan went down to Sligo for a game. Haven't haven't done games in Dublin as well. Like it's it's tough. It, the problem is, is if you turn around and say, okay, listen, we, we'll bring more referees. Does it incur extra cost on the clubs? Does it incur extra cost? Is it is it a cost thing? Like, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be bad, but the the women's national league is, is is seen slightly below the the league of Ireland on the Friday night. Whereas a lot of referees, there's a lot of games on a Saturday. You've got underage men's, women's. So there's a lot of referees. So the pool of resources. To ha- the poll may not be available, may not be there for the amount of top referees that we do need. So that's probably why we're seeing more and more referees do the same sort of games. I don't have a problem with Lions people and fourth officials uh, being repeated or being locals or being because the influence they can have on a game is it's not nothing, but it's not everything, if that makes sense. It's fairly limited offsides, maybe a couple of words with the ref here and there. But I think the referee should be rotated. I have no problem with somebody local being on a game as long as it's not the same person every week. And I know when I was involved with a, a team at this level, we saw the same guy every second week, and it just wasn't wasn't good enough. Like, but listen, it is what it is. We're going to wrap up before we hit the hour mark, though, Aaron. It's one of the rules we have here on the show. So uh, we'll give it up 90 seconds before we wrap up. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much to Jenna Slattery for joining us this week. A pleasure, as always, to be joined by one of the up-and-coming talents in the league. I'm not quite sure who we'll have on next week. We'll see what happens out of this week's game. You'll see who scores a match winner in the first 10 minutes of a game and <laughs> invite them on next week. Uh, now that we've had Jenna on, of course, she's going to score a hat-trick in Belfield at the weekend and Gal will win 3-0 and uh, it'll be all our all our responsibility. We take credit for it. Aaron, pleasure as always and uh, we shall be back with you again next week. Don't forget you can get match reports, previews of all the games, statistics of all the games on our website, finalwhistle.ie. Uh, we'll be back with you next week. We will talk to you then.